the tumor soldiers watched in vain was borrowed for three days his body there would not remain cause our God has robbed the
pretty good podcast it's 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 reaching it's reaching people not just here in america but throughout the world and also we're going to do our annual thanksgiving meals and april gave me a great idea she's like let's just do the families so if you're able to donate one thanksgiving meal we're doing 10 families this year so please let april or i know uh, if you want to donate a meal we want to deliver on november 21st the saturday before thanksgiving so if we're able to do that please let me or april know And we're going to be in prayer this week. I know the elections this week. This country, I believe, still belongs to God. We're going to pray for peace. We're going to pray for God to just bless America and keep us safe and united. And pray that his will be done. He appoints the leaders. So, wow, I'm still, praise team did awesome. Let's welcome our pastor to the front. Amen. Come on, give God glory. Uh, again, my, my book, put it up, should be coming up. Been working on this for, I would say, my whole Christian walk. Uh, it's a short book, so you, you'll be able to read it in an hour or two. Um, but that's the a summary. Leave it up for a little bit so that you, uh, we can read it. Uh, my wife has the order uh, list there. Uh, they tell me it's due to print on the 9th. So once that happens, then I should be getting copies here soon. Uh, so make sure to get yours. As well as my wife mentioned, uh, early voting is over. So if you haven't voted yet, you have to be uh, going on Tuesday uh, to do the the regular voting, so make sure that you do that. There's been many people that have paid the ultimate price so that we have this honor and this privilege. You know, I'm not here to advocate and tell you who to go vote for. I just want you to go vote. Uh, that it's, you know, don't let the sacrifice of the many be in vain. So make sure that you do vote. Amen. One time I didn't like the, the, the two 
choices that we had, so I wrote myself in. So there's some, in one of the elections, I got one vote for president, so. <laughs> I, I can't even remember how long ago that was, but, but make sure you vote, okay? Make sure that you do do that. Um, go ahead and grab your Bibles, open them with me to Acts, <coughs> Acts chapter 2. We're going to go to verse 36. This morning I'm reading to you from the Christian Standard Bible. Excuse me. If you have it in a different translation, please do follow along with me. We'll begin with verse 36. If you don't have uh, your Bible with you, don't worry. We do have the words up on the screen for you. I think this screen is easier to read. Verse 36, Acts chapter 2, this is the word of the Lord. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When they heard this, they were pierced to their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized each of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call. With many other words, he testified and strongly urged them saying, be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to, the, to them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed, to the, pro distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the men. Every day the Lord added to their numbers those who were being saved. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for all you do, all you've done, all you're about to do, Lord. Thank you for allowing us yet again to be in your house where there is fullness of joy. Thank you because we know that today we will experience signs and wonders. We will see miracles. We will see the chaos come to peace. The roaring winds Come and be still. Today I know that those that are lacking will be provided for. Today I know that those who are sick will be healed. Because you are the God who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or even think of. So we place ourselves in your hands and we ask you, have your way. Speak to each and every one of us, Lord. You know what we need. You know our hearts. You know every obstacle that we face. And we know that through you, we can do all things. Because you are our strength. Lord, I place myself in your hands and I ask you, use me. Use me to speak to your children. Let your Holy Spirit flow in this, your house. Don't allow me to speak my feelings or my thoughts or even my emotions. Let your Holy Spirit, Lord, freely flow in this, your house. I humbly ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Come on, give God glory this morning. You may be seated. Uh, today, I want to start a new preaching series. And it's uh, generosity. 
Uh, we are entering a season of thanks and a season of giving. Uh, thanksgiving, but, you know, we can split that up and understand that we are entering a season where we have to learn and remember to be thankful. Thankful for all the many things we have. Thankful for all the many things that God is doing. Thankful for all the many things that God has kept us from. You know, it's oftentimes we're only thankful for the blessings we receive. But really we should be thankful for all the things we didn't receive. The things that could have destroyed us. The, the things that could have harmed us. So we should be thankful. Thankful that he is our God. Thankful that we are alive. Thankful that we were able to come into his house. Thankful that we were born and live in this great nation. Thankful for the many blessings that he continues to pour out over our lives. But in addition to being thankful, it's also a season of giving. You know, as you uh, well know, every year we, we select around 15 families or so. As our church grows, we'll select even more. But we select around 15 families or so so that we can provide a full Thanksgiving meal for them. Uh, this year we're asking each of you, each family, to at least sponsor one family where you can get the turkey, all the side trimmings, you know, the drinks, the dessert, everything so that we can then go deliver. You can take part in that as well, you know, as uh, the delivery date. You can see Miss April uh, uh, or my wife uh, after service for that. But it is a season of giving. You know, th there's many of us in here are blessed by God. God has been good to us. Come on. Amen. There's some of us in our communities that have not fared so well. For whatever reason, we, that's not the at issue right now, but they are in need. So if we're able to, we should be able to go out and give. That's why I wanted to start a series on generosity. And for today, it is uh, for every action, a reaction. For every action, a reaction. Know this, uh, I picked up the text right after what's called or what's known as Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came and filled uh, the believers that were in the upper room, about 120 or so. And right after that, Peter, empowered by the Holy Spirit, preached this passionate message that pierced and convicted those people that wanted Jesus dead. So much so that about 3,000, can you imagine that? One preaching, about 3,000 get saved and get baptized. Imagine that, just one day, just like that. But the, the cause was, or the action was, the Holy Spirit coming upon the believers. The reaction to that was the empowerment to be able to reach others for Christ. Right? So for every action, there is always a reaction. For every action, there's always a reaction. Someone said that, you know, there's a cause and effect, right? For every cause, there's something that happens afterwards. I always tell people every choice comes with a consequence. Every choice comes with a consequence. It could be good or it could be bad. And it all depends on the choice. So for every action, there is a reaction or a result. Something happens because of what we did or did not do. There could be inaction. And we miss the blessing of God because we didn't step up. We miss the blessing of God because we want you to play church. I've told you this story of the time that I held up a, a bill. I, I forget. Maybe a $1 bill, 5 or $10 bill. And I went around the church kind of telling people that this is what God has for you. And many, many of us were playing church. <clears throat> what was our response to that? Say, God has this for you. And they said, well, praise God. Amen. Yes, I believe that. Went to another person. Hey, God has this for you. Glory. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Went to another. God has this for you. Oh, glory to God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Answered prayer. Finally, I got to this one person and said, God has this for you. He got up and took it. 
And, and that's what happens with so many of us, is that we like to play church. We like the Christianese language that we speak. We want to say praise God, but never really have any action to come along with what we're saying. So, you know, it, today I want to really get at you that every action comes with a reaction or a result. Number one, the action of Pentecost caused the reaction of the outpouring of unity. Now, remember, before this, there was so much, um, <clears throat> so much trouble, so much disunity. People were after the believers. They, they killed Jesus. But at the outpouring at Pentecost, that action caused a reaction of unity. So anytime there are uh, struggles, anytime there are battles, anytime there are obstacles, it's because there's something on the other side of that mountain. There's something on the other side of that war. There's something on the other side of that chaos that God has for you that the enemy does not want you to get. Are you following me here? So you have to understand that if you have resistance, is because God has a blessing on the other side of the mountain. The Holy Spirit empowered or anointed Peter and the disciples to preach passionate, powerful, anointed messages. Messages that would pierce the heart. They weren't convicting anyone. I've often told people, it is not my job to convict anyone. I preach the word of God, and if it hurts you, if it empowers you, if it makes you laugh, if it makes you cry, that's not my doing. That is what the Holy Spirit is doing in each of your lives. It's not my job to go and find out what you're doing at home. He knows. It's not my job to keep track of what you're thinking or not thinking. That's his job. And when, when we preach, when preachers around the world preach, it is the Holy Spirit that brings the conviction that we need. It is the, the stirring, the waking up that we need in order to hear the word of the Lord. <clears throat> People have said, Pastor, this question was asked to me not too long ago. Uh, what do you think of uh, freedom of choice? Or, you know, we're born with it. I said, yeah. I said, but until we are made alive. You know, we're dead. The Bible says we're dead in our sins. So as long as we're dead in our sins, there's nothing we can uh, choose, right? Go to the cemetery. People don't choose anything there. They're dead. So when we are dead in our sins, uh, we can't choose. So the Holy Spirit makes us alive when the message of God comes. He makes us alive. And then at that point, once we are made alive, we have the choice. Do we follow it? Do we accept it? Or do we reject it? That's when I believe freedom of choice is. I could be wrong. You know, there's other theories behind it. But I believe that when we are dead in our sins, there's nothing we can do. We can't choose right or wrong. But when the Holy Spirit makes us alive, he opens our eyes to the message of Christ, to the message of the kingdom. And at that point, we decide whether we accept it or we don't. Every action comes with a reaction. About 3,000 people, when, when uh, the Holy Spirit made them alive, accepted the message. When they were alive, they said, yes, we repent. We repent for all of our sins. We repent for everything we did. And about 3,000 of them were added to their number. Imagine that. Preaching a message to a whole bunch of people that want you dead. A whole bunch of people that want you dead. And then the Holy Spirit brings conviction on all of them. Or a big portion of them. Or to be more specific, about 3,000 of them. And they say, what do we need to do? It wasn't that Peter was some scholar or that he had eloquence of speech. It was that the Holy Spirit went and made them alive to the promises and to the word of God. 
So when Pentecost happens, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, there's something that happens to believers, those that have repented. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. See, when, when you are made alive, you need that milk, that meat to continue to exist, to continue to move forward. It's kind of like babies. When they're in the womb, they depend on mom and her eating habits. Once they come out of the womb, then it's their only thing. The only thing that they can do is to eat, to grow. And as they get older, you know, they, they don't wait on mom anymore. As they learn to make their own sandwiches and make their own cereal and make their own ham and egg sandwiches. And, and as they learn to do all these things, whether mom is home or not, they feed themselves because they know I need this. So it's true with the children of God. When you are made alive and you know that you've tasted and have seen that the Lord is good, you want to be in the teachings of the Lord. You want to be in the house of God. You want to go from place to place, fellowship, breaking bread with other believers. You want to be around other believers because they encourage you and they strengthen you. You don't want to be around a whole bunch of unbelievers unless you, are, uh, unless you are trying to win them over to Christ. Come on. They devoted themselves, the Bible says, to fellowship and to breaking bread. Now, they, they, that doesn't mean that they were hitting each other with bread. But, you know, they were, they were eating, having fellowship. You know, I, I, never, I never knew this. You know, before I became a Christian, I, I used to go to, like, these little bars and stuff and hang out with, uh, with a whole bunch of guys. And, you know, we were just hanging out and drink. We, we didn't really eat much. We, we did other stuff. And when I became a Christian, I realized that Christians really love eating. I mean, it, Christians love to have cookouts and and love to just sit down and talk and laugh and, and enjoy each other's company. And I started doing that and I really said, you know, I felt like, wow, this is what I've been missing. Fellowship. Not just companionship, but fellowship. So you have to devote yourself to this fellowship. That's why we need to kickstart our, our home groups, our embassies, so that we can go and reach others. So that they can come over to your house. So that they can bre break bread with you. So that they can ask you questions. So that you can lead them to Christ. The Bible says that they also devoted themselves to meeting from house to house. Why? Because once you have the Holy Spirit, you, you, you want to be with other people like you. You want to be with other Holy Spirit people. So you go to their house. They come to yours. You hang out at their place. You, they, they come and hang out at your place. They were together in unity. After Pentecost, the reaction was a great outpouring of unity. When the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we want to be together. The Psalm 133, the psalmist said, how good and pleasant it is for brothers to live together in unity. He said, how good and pleasant it is to live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows blessing, his blessing, even life forevermore. Where is his blessing? In unity. Where is life forevermore? Once we are made alive, it is in unity. When we come together in unity. And the Bible says that they had a common goal. They had everything in common. In other words, they knew what they needed to do. 
Now, unity does not mean uniformity. We don't all have to look the same. We don't all have to eat the same. We don't all have to praise the same. We don't all have to, you know, experience the same thing. But we have to have a common goal, a common vision to reach the lost. That's why we're here. We're here to be equipped so that we can go and reach those that need Jesus. Come on, somebody. Give God glory. As this unity came on, something else happened. Number two, the action of generosity. It caused the reaction of great power in preaching. Understand that when we are generous, when we are generous, preaching is more effective. Come on. When people know that they can come and receive something, not just spiritually, but physically, preaching makes more sense. It's a little bit more powerful. It means something. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 32 to 37. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. That's what happens when you're in unity. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. Can you believe that? You come to a church and no needy person is in the church. If you come with needs, the, the, the unity covers you so that you don't have a need. I heard of a church, I, I think it was in England somewhere. Uh, I have to look it up, but I, I heard of a church where everybody that came in, uh, their needs were met. Their needs were met. The families in there were, were so well taken care of each other that when somebody came in and they were struggling, they said, I got January. And somebody else said, I got February. And someone, I got March. And everybody together, they covered that family for at least a year so that they can overcome whatever struggles they had. Can you imagine coming to a church when you're struggling and the church does that? Doesn't preaching just have a little bit more <laughs> to it? Come on. Amen. It, it, it means a little more. Instead of just words, it, it's actually words that are attached with action. Where the people are doing uh, the word. They're not just hearing the word, but they are doers of the word. The Bible says there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who own lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now it says he sold a field he owned. He didn't sold every field he owned. He sold a field he owned. He sold something so that he can come and contribute for the greater need. So great grace was upon them because they had everything in common. Great grace was upon them because they were generous. Great grace comes upon you when you become generous. The, the power of God comes over you and will give you the grace. Like he told Paul, my grace is sufficient. Even though he was struggling with something, God said, my grace is sufficient. When you are in generosity, when you are practicing generosity, the grace of the Lord will be sufficient to whatever it is that you're going through. Let me tell you, there's people with money that don't have peace. <clears throat> there are poor people that aren't godly. I know that many people have said, you know, to be poor means to be godly. No, that's a lie from the pit of hell. So it is when we are generous, when the needs 
are met, that people begin to be more receptive to the power of God, uh, to the message of Christ. Where all needs are met. When you come to the church, there should be no need. There, there should be no need for government assistance in the house of God. At least that's the way it was in the early church. There was no government assistance. It was the church. The church was responsible for taking care of its people. For taking care of people that, in their community. The church was responsible. It wasn't the government. But it was the church being generous. It wasn't socialism. It was fellowship. Are you with me here? I know that, you know, it, it sounds great to have some socialist uh, activities and stuff, but it, it's not, that doesn't do anything for you. It doesn't solve the problem. Fellowship, it helps us. Generosity opens doors for the kingdom of God advancing. Generosity will open doors for people to listen to you. I've got, people have invited me out to eat, and I say, okay, you know, pastor, can I tell you something? You can tell me anything you want. You're paying. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, they invited me, so you, you talk. I listen. You talk. I eat. Right? And uh, it, so they, they share with me. Why? Because generosity opens doors. The Bible says that your gift will make room for you. When the queen of Sheba came over to see Solomon, she came with gifts. <clears throat> see, that, that's something that, that the, the people of God have forgotten. They come to church to withdraw. Rarely do we come to church to make deposits. To help in the children's church, to clean up, you know, to, to be involved. We, we often come to withdraw. Come on. Are you with me? The action of generosity causes the reaction of power in preaching. Why power in preaching? Hey, be generous to anyone. They'll listen to you. They'll listen to you. Go, go, go buy them a meal. They'll listen to what you have to say. Invite them over to your house. Put out a spread for them. They'll listen to you. Generosity has a way of giving you authority and more power in your preaching and in your witness. Greediness has the opposite effect on that. <clears throat> Number three. The action of greed causes the reaction of destruction. At the end of chapter 4 in Acts, we see that Barnabas sold a property he owned and he gave it to the apostles so that the needs could be met. At the beginning of chapter 5, we meet Ananias and Sapphira who also had land, who also sold the land. No one told them, this is what you have to do. This is something that they wanted to do. Verse 1, now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. This continuing from chapter 4 where Barnabas sold his property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself. Was that wrong? <clears throat> Absolutely not. It was his property. He could do with his property whatever he wanted to do with his own property. But brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. He brought the rest. Was there anything wrong with that? No. It was his. Then Peter said to Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourselves some of the money you received for the land? Now here's the problem. Didn't it belong to you before? Before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? 
What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. In other words, he sold his property, came to Peter and said, here's everything I got from selling the property. He didn't have to say that. He could have just said, listen, I sold the property. I'm keeping a part of it for other stuff, and I'm giving half of it to you. And the Holy Spirit would have said, great. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is not in need of money. God is not in need of money. Heaven is not going bankrupt. I mean, the church is made, but not heaven, not the kingdom of God. Ministries, maybe, but not the kingdom of God. So we don't lie to people. It is the Holy Spirit that knows our hearts. It is the Holy Spirit that knows everything about us. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit knows how much money you make. He knows if you're calling a tithe, you know, a smaller percentage. He knows everything about you. So it, it has nothing to do with what you own. It has everything to do with the condition of our hearts. If we're greedy, that we keep. There's nothing wrong with keeping what you worked so hard for. But you have to make sure that you give God what belongs to him. And then don't lie when you keep it. So oh, something came up and, you know, you just couldn't give this week. That's fine with me. But if you're saying something came up meant that, you know, you had to go on an extra vacation or buy an extra pair of shoes or, you know, that's between you and God. Don't allow greed to cause you to start lying. That's what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. The greed caused them to lie. So see, poverty is a mindset that needs to be destroyed. I have met many people. I have met rich people and I have met poor people. I have met rich people who are very generous and I have met rich people who are very greedy. I have met poor people who are very generous and I have met poor people who are very greedy. Poverty is a mindset and it needs to be destroyed because you can be rich and on your way to poverty with a wrong mindset. Money is not the answer to poverty. It never has been. Jesus said, the poor, you'll always have. It wasn't because there wasn't enough money in the world. It was because it's a mindset that people are, are stuck in. A way of thinking. 70%, listen to this, 70% of lottery winners end up bankrupt within five years. 70%. This is according to the National Endowment of Financial Education. This happens to athletes, to celebrities. You give a, a, a poor person a whole large influx of money, and within five years, they'll be broke, 70% of them. Why? Their mindset. They think poor. And eventually, the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So it's a mindset. We have to change the way we think of things. Many go bankrupt after sudden influx. But it doesn't have to be that way. But we have to change the way we think. We think, oh, I finally got some money, and we forget about everything. This is what happens every February, March, April, and possibly May. You have a whole bunch of people at church. Like, oh, Lord, help me, help me, help me. Income comes in, and you don't see them for a few weeks until they're broke again, you know, and then they come back. And then they're back to, oh, Lord, help me, help me, help me. It's a mindset. It's a mindset that needs to be changed. This, this is the thing that God does in our lives. When God comes and, 
and the Holy Spirit transforms us. He transforms, he begins the process of whole transformation, complete transformation. Our thinking has to change. The Bible says be renewed in your thinking, right? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll see and approve God's good and perfect will for you. You'll understand what God wants you to do when you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we have to change the way, think, uh, the way we think. Money is not the answer. It is not. It never has been. Because easy come, come on. See, some of you, you heard this. It's been around forever. Easy come, easy go. A change of mind changes the outcomes. A change in your, you change your mind, you change your life. You change your present, you change your future. So don't waste time on yesterday. It is dead. There's nothing you can do about yesterday's mistakes. It's dead. You can't change them. Yesterday can't be changed. Let, let me tell you that again. Yesterday cannot be changed. Doesn't matter how hard you try, how often you want to do that, it will not change. That stuff you said to that old relationship, it, that won't change. It doesn't change. Yesterday is dead. It cannot be changed. Greed leads to lying. So don't let that happen to you. Change your current way of thinking, and tomorrow will be much better for you. Right? We have equal opportunity, not equal results. Understand that. That we live in a land of opportunity, and we all have the same opportunity. I know that some people say, well, no, because I grew up in this side of town, and they... No, we all have the same. I grew up in a rat, rough side of town. Probably the roughest in San Antonio. So if you have the right mindset, you can get out and become everything that God wants you to be. Mindset. Equal opportunity. We can all change our circumstances when we learn to change our mind. How do we change our mind? The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Whatever is true, whatever is lovely, remember that? Whatever is noble, whatever is praiseworthy, think about those things. Stop wasting time on fake stuff. Social media has it really ruined so many people's lives. Because they're looking at all these celebrities thinking that that's the way life really is. It's not. It's not. Nobody looks like that. You know, what do you call those um, fillers or filters? Yeah, you know, they can make you look however you want. You know, so don't. Be everything God wants you to be. Be you. Be you. I've never lived in a time where everybody wanted to look the same. They go and get stuff on their lips so that their lips can grow. So that they can look like somebody who has big lips. I, I just, they cut their hair so that they can look like some celebrity that, you know, they, I just don't get it. You were made to be you. Be you. You know, there's no reason to be a copy. If you are a copy, you'll always be a cheap imitation. Always. Only the original is good. Come on. Are you, are you following? So be you. Don't do anything to yourself because, you know, you want to look like somebody else. 
If you're, if you're going to make any changes to your body, do it because it's you. Because you want to. Not to look like anyone else. Don't imitate anyone else. You're too valuable. The Bible says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. As a matter of fact, God took his time with you to make you unique. So unique that not two of you in the whole entire world share the same fingerprint. Even if you're twins, you don't share the same fingerprint. Even if you were identical, you don't share the same fingerprint. Because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. So don't become someone else. Be you. Number four, the action of obedience. The reaction of blessing. Understand that when we are obedient to God, God has set in place some principles to bless us. There is no getting around it. If you obey God, God blesses you. Deuteronomy chapter uh, 15, verse 4 and 5. However, there should be no poor among you. Whoo, man, that is heavy. Just starting it there. However, there should be no poor among you. For in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bless you. In other words, when you are in the promise of God, no one should be poor because God has already provided for you. The land contains everything you need so that no one can be poor. But here's the, the kicker, the qualifier. Verse 5. If, come on, say that with me. If, come on, say it loud. Only you fully obey the Lord. If, only you fully obey the Lord. So you're going to be richly blessed if you fully obey the Lord. The only way you're going to be richly blessed is if only you obey the Lord and are careful to follow all the commands I am giving you today. So God's saying, no one will be poor if you obey. Woo! Now, is that a promise or is that a promise? Come on. God said, if you obey, don't worry about poverty. So again, a mindset, right? Because the poverty mindset tells you, oh, you just want me under you. You just want to tell me what to do. Nobody tells me what to do. That's a poverty mindset. But obedience said, I am subjecting myself to you. And God says, when you do that, no one will be poor. Obedience to the word of God is a solution to ending poverty. Jesus was obedient to the Father. Philippians tells us, uh, uh, Paul tells us in Philippians, uh, and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus was obedient even to the point of death. Jesus was also obedient to his parents. I don't know if you remember this, but Jesus went and kind of ran away from the family during a, a, a festival. And he ran away to the church. And he was in the church teaching people. And he was around 12 years old when he was teaching people. Mary and Joseph found out about a day later that they were missing Jesus. So they had to go back and find Jesus. So they were going there. And about three days later, they finally find Jesus and he's in the temple. And when they find Jesus, Mary's kind of upset like any mom would be, right? Yeah. She's kind of upset. And she gets him out and she says, Jesus, why would you do this to me? And Jesus said, what's wrong with you? I need to be about my father's business. And if, if Mary was like my mom, a Mexican mom, she would say like, you know, what father's business are you talking about? <laughs> you know, it, with every syllable, it was a slap. <laughs> right? <laughs> Come on, how many of you have moms like that? Miss <laughs> April, don't, don't, your mom's here. <laughs> if your mom's here, don't raise your hand. <laughs> but, but, you know, they, 
I, I, re- I don't know if everybody does this, but Mexican mom love to hit by syllables. They just, you know, every syllable, they could, what is wrong with you? It's like, so that's, hey, so, so Jesus, you know, he, he, they finally find him. And now he goes out with Mary and Mary saying, you know, why, why did you do this? I had to be about my father's business. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. What happened? He became obedient or he was obedient to his parents. Verse 52, and Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. And the next thing we hear is that Jesus is 30. Right? He was 12 and then the next thing we hear is Jesus is 30. Now, you know, get in trouble with Mary. (laughs) You get grounded for 18 years. So obedience causes blessings to follow you. Favor. In Deuteronomy 28 and 2. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. How many blessings? All of them. And and it goes on. You know, so when you get home, read chapter 28 of Deuteronomy. And you'll see all the blessings. You're going to be blessed in the city, blessed in the country, blessed coming in, blessed going out. Your flocks will be blessed. Your children will be blessed. Their children will be blessed. In essence, what it's saying is your whole DNA, your whole bloodline is going to be blessed when you learn to obey God. When you are generous. Because for every action... There's a reaction. And when the action of obedience comes, uh, the reaction of blessing is attached to it. Obedience causes prosperity to follow your DNA and all the work of your hands. Deuteronomy 30 verse 9 and 10. Then the Lord your God will make you most prosperous. How prosperous? See, and you can't get any most than most, Right? Most prosperous in all the work of your hands and in the fruit of your womb, that means your children, and the young of your livestock, that means your work, everything that you do, and the crops of your land, everything you put your hand to, the Lord will again delight in you. In other words, he'll come back, you'll you'll please him again, you'll have a restored relationship with with God, he'll be protecting you and blessing you, he'll again delight in you and make you prosperous, just as he delighted in your fathers, if you obey the Lord your God. And keep his commands and decrees that are written in the book of the law. And turn to the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. So when you obey, you will be preferred. When you obey, his love will follow you and it will fill you. Number five, last one. Here it is. The action of sacrifice. The reaction of increase. The poverty mindset says, I can't give you because I have so little. The action of sacrifice says, this is all I've got. And if my need is greater than my seed, then I can't eat my seed. Right? I have to deposit my seed. If what I have in my hands is not good enough to meet all of my needs, then it is my seed. See, if it can't pay off my house, then it's just the seed. If it can't pay for my my kid's college, then it's just the seed. Because if it's not sufficient for all of my needs, it is a seed. The action of sacrifice causes the reaction of increase. Jesus was sacrificed and there was an increase of many believers that have come to the Lord. Millions upon millions. Complete dependence on God leads to provision from God. You have to depend on God to be able to withdraw from God. Your sacrifice will never go unnoticed. God sees all of your sacrifice. 
So it is time to sacrifice for his glory. It is time to sacrifice for his house. Look at what the Lord spoke through the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Get, give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but had harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put clothes on, but are never warm enough. You earn wages only to put them in, in purses with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because you, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I call for a drought on the fields and the mountain, on the grain and the new wine, the oil and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle and on all the labor of your hands. I said, pause until my house until you have enough to sacrifice for my house, says the Lord. Your sacrifice for the Lord will never be in vain. Make your actions count. It's time to get generous and start building the house of God. Come on, somebody, give God glory. Come on, give him glory this morning. Give them glory for every action. There's a reaction. And I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, it's time. It's time. Those that sacrifice will not sacrifice in vain, says the Lord. I see their work. I see their hearts. I see their needs. And I will provide not only provide for today, but for generations to come. I have you in my hand, says the Lord. I am the great provider. I am the great supplier. I'm the great healer. Are you willing to sacrifice? I loved you and I gave my son for you. Are you ready to sacrifice? It's time. I hear the Lord saying, it is time. It's time. I see him with his finger about to press that reset button. Are you ready to be on this side of the reset? It's not time to hide. It's not time to run away. It's not time to be away. It's time. It's time to be about the Father's business. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I know it is scary at times. Because we only see what we, what we have in front of us. But God is saying, I have so much more. I have so much more that I want to release to you. I have so much more that is coming to you. Yes, yes, Lord. Do it, Father. Do it, do it, do it. Yes, Lord. It's time. Every action has a reaction. Ooh, see, see, 
You got to see this. When you're in the presence of the Almighty, <laughs> and you take the action, the reaction is a hundredfold. 